First time I think you open the question who is going to be president. It's been already agreed that only in the next five years, machine would be sitting on the board of trustees. And they already in some companies do, in states, since of the many creatures. I'm certain when we reach the last stage of artificial intelligence, the, the sports state, when machines are by themselves and decide by themselves, that machines will be presidents. Change is always something present in human history. And also in terms of the tremendous change brought by human technology. Gunpower, <coughs> the Model T, computer, and now this scenario, and always that we have for it, love this movement in England, but always, always that we've been a, a little bit optimistically naive. But uh, I say, for example, nowadays, great shambo are created by the fact that no country is in process of guiding the economy because an algorithm can help somebody that we don't even know and doesn't have the money to do a trillion investment in nanoseconds. But who allows that? So I would uh, <laughs> uh, sort of agree with uh, Zaklo that uh, is us is not the machine. Also because if uh, it's the machine, we declare ourselves impotent. What about uh, using uh, also the machine, uh, I mean, uh, which is us uh, having uh, uh, you know, our intelligence uh, to manipulate the reality, to have, uh, for example, like uh, you have uh, environmental impact, uh, you know, need of approval before you build uh, a factory, you know, why don't we have uh, people-centered uh, technology that cannot uh, be produced uh, unless uh, you are, you know, sure that it's not going to backfire. You still will have uh, the problem in, like uh, we have with terrorism uh, and dirty bombs, uh, but uh, uh, let's put our fear in a concrete uh, technological because technology cannot be stopped, eh? so the only thing is damage prevention. The re the recent, recent history, let's say the two, two hundred last year, uh, latest years, has been the history of capital accumulation. And within this, this long trend, we have had several technological revolutions. The last one we called, and they, they come at uh, roughly 60, 50, 60 years intervals. That's well researched and it's more or less well established. The last one was the information technology revolution. And we don't know and we never know which is the next one until we are there. Now, the only thing I would like to say about it is that uh, um, the next communication uh, this, the devices that we have will be as different from what we have today with internet as internet was to the people before in the 1950s. Who would think of internet and all these problems that we are dealing with today? Nobody. I mean, there were machines, communicating machines, robots, everything, but no one could predict exactly what would be the, the type of problems that we have today. <coughs> so what will happen in the future, really, we are unable to predict to that extent. And what will be done if the present trend continues is that the next uh, technological revolution will add to capital accumulation. And that is our problem here today and yesterday we, we saw that with the problem of democracy is in fact the overarching power of financial power over uh, the powers, political power. So the next wave, if nothing happens, will be a wave of capital accumulation that is <coughs> power accumulated by, by a very few people. And of course, when that happens, inequality rises. 
And I'll, I agree that our problem basically today will be as diminishing, uh, eliminating inequality. Poverty is one of the greatest inequalities we have. It's a great problem, and it is through there, through uh, uh, you know intervention by the peoples, that this will somehow uh, can be sort of tamed. If not, we'll continue discussing these things on and on. I, w I think I would be better uh, to fo focus uh, um, my areas on social <laughs> ignorance, because uh, that, that is, will be a, an answer to your first question, that is, who regulates technology? And my little answer is social ignorance. I give you immediately a, a simple example. A few weeks ago, a self-driving driving car by Uber killed a woman on pedestrian passage, you know? Okay, it may happen, but for me, the worst thing that was attached to that event is that the policy uh, called to, you know, to overlook the, 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 the situation declared, oh, that was an inevitable <coughs> issue. Thank you. We're talking about the impacts of uh, technology, media, uh, and social networks on democracy. We're not discussing philosophical aspects of the general impacts of the technology on civilization and future of humanity. Uh, to, to, uh, to start, I wanted just to mention that a week ago, there was the first election in the world in Sierra Leone, which was done on the basis of the blockchain. And it is something of a new fact that we will live, for better or worse. And immediately, when trying to understand the consequences of that, whether it's good or bad, uh, it reminded me the old novel, maybe you have read it, maybe not, it's a novel of uh, Frederick Brown, published in the 60s and it is called The Weapon. I'll uh, briefly describe because it uh, shows the problem better than any long discussions. Uh, a scientist working on the ultimate weapon. A visitor comes to see him and starts to explain to him the consequences of that. Uh, uh, and he cannot, uh, cannot convince him. At that moment, a kid, uh, a child, or this scientist who is a retarded child, uh, uh, requests some attention, and the scientist leaves to give him a meal for, I don't remember. When he comes back, the room, the, the, the person has left, and he sees that in the hands of his child, a loaded gun. And he takes the gun from the child, child's hands and thinks, who should be that guy to give the loaded revolver in the hands of an idiot. And I think that we should understand that it's not technology to be, to be blamed for anything, it's our choices mm -hmm. that we do. Sure. And uh, let me just be more specific. Yes, in, in 10 years, the world will be completely different. Meta web, uh, permanent uh, presence in the internet of 80% of the people, 10% of the wearable clothes will be connected to the internet. They will be implantable uh, smart devices by that time. 5% uh, printed uh, on 3D computer goods, etc., etc. So uh, new technology can either help or aggravate the situation with the democracy we are facing today, and we should be aware of that. How can it help? It can overcome the limitations of the large constituencies that were the reason of introduction of the representative uh, democracy. Also, it can, of course, unite people, and we know that it uh, uh, has been done already in many parts of the world, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But we have a control, technical control. In China, 180 million cameras. Today, the President uh, Xi becomes again an emperor of China, and I am afraid for forever because of the 
control of the big brother today, which will be implemented. Russia has interfered in the elections in the United States. Where are the guarantees that the uh, uh, governments today do not interfere in their own elections using the same technologies and they will have much better possibilities to, to, to achieve the results. And finally, not, uh, uh, last but not least, all the technology provides the possibility only to the constituency to answer the questions. But we know in every poll who formulates the question and how the question is formulated is most important. So I'm afraid that ultimately this new technology can undermine the uh, de democratic status today. And that could lead to a uh, uh, very uh, damaging consequences because democracy, I know, I, I, I know, uh, yes, uh, because democracy reduces the price of our mistakes and if we diminish, we will have to pay much larger prices in the future. Thank you. I just want to say something about the use of social medias. And I want to tell you a story um, about my country. There is a rap group, you know, the yo-yo type of singers, okay? It's called Dark Polo Gang, and they have a huge fan base and very young fans. And during the last elections, they've been using the social medias to tell their fans not to vote for the Democratic Party, for the Five Stars Movement or whatever, but to vote for Dark Polo Gang, vote for the Dark Oligarchy, vote for Tony Efe, which who is the head of the group. And you have no idea of how many young people wasted their votes writing on the voting paper Tony Efe and Dark Oligarchy. So how should democracies deal with the social medias? I think that the ones doing the politics should try to learn something from these people. They should use the social medias as Instagram to connect with young people and to communicate with them with their same language in order to convince them that democracy is worth. That's it. Yeah. Uh, uh, relation between democracy and technology and including the, including the uh, media, uh, we must, uh, or it must be seen from the point of uh, values, we agree that they are common. That is the first problem, which values are common or can we agree? They are, of course, international uh, acts. They are national uh, regulation that that uh, expresses those values. But uh, in the analysis of this relation, uh, we should start from the uh, as much as possible uh, description or or. Uh, the perception of the reality. Because uh, it is important to be aware of the, of the gap that exists between the intent of uh, humans and science and politics, especially, to express this, that, this reality and reality as such. Uh, that is a problem because, uh, as we know, the, the process of change starts from the precise, uh, uh, precise assumption or expression of the reality, and we agree and we speak that it is uh, far from the basic uh, values uh, we are talking about, equality, privacy of human being, 
value of the identity, not only of human beings, but of social groups, etc. Therefore, uh, that is, uh, of course, the main question, who is uh, controlling these means for the purpose of uh, the decision-making process or systems like uh, democracy is, and which rules can be agreed on the na both on national and international level. Thank you. We are, of course, living in the period of new technologies, that's true. The second moment is actually connection to democracy, as seen in the level of information. It is really easy to receive all information in the world. Uh, in a couple of seconds, we know actually what's happened in Peking, in Beijing. It's really easy today. But we have new problem. That's this new revolution of fake industry. Fake news industry is all around us. We know that, of course. Uh, the, uh, the negative point of this is actually uh, we don't know actually what really happened in Beijing. We are seeing information, but we are really not sure what's really happened. Uh, these new technologies and information help us to develop new terms. One in my domain, and come from diplomacy, is Twitter diplomacy. If you really want to know what's really happened today in America, Please go to the Mr. President account and you will see what he will tweet. Without it, you will not, uh, you, will, you will actually not have information about what will happen in America, actually in the global world. Um, today, if I, if I calculate good, we have here more, more than 15 letters open and we are working in the moment. We are actually dependent of these laptops, of smartphones, and that is our life. Um, through this, I have two awareness challenges. Most of us working with the laptops last 15 years, 20 years. Most of us. This means, this means actually we started to work with the laptops in our 30s or 40s. So, we know the life without technology, without laptops, without smartphones. But our children, they actually start to live with the phones, smartphones, with laptops. <coughs> they actually use social networks from early age. They don't know to live without new technologies. They don't know how is actually that possible um, the second thing is, of course, it's already mentioned by Vladko Lagunzia, is the question is, of course, big topic, not only in Europe. It's privacy versus security. And that is actually something that we probably need deeply to discuss here. Thank you. Um, so I think, I think we have to think about how we can defend ourselves and our democracies uh, from technologies, because uh, what we are seeing right now around the globe, from US to France, Germany, Italy, or so forth. So it's hacked and we have, again, we have security versus or our privacy. So what is better for us? Privacy or security of our elections, of our democracies, of our um, household, of our personal lives? So this is a, for me, this is the main question. Um, what is a first, privacy or security? Or security or privacy? And there's no answer. Depends on many, many um, issues after this. Yes, thank you. So the session is on technology, media, and social media. I was visiting a TV station in Montreal a few weeks ago, and you really see the impact of technology. Uh, they were giving me a tour and showing where they are recording the news. A few years back, you had 15, 20 people working and making sure the news would be properly prepared now there's one young person and the guy in fact in charge of uh, the news in Montreal was 28 years old and he was not only recording the news live but also working with another studio in a different town and, and doing that at the same time so that's one impact of technology it used to be a whole group of people working on the news 20 30 people now it's one person and they used to be very experienced now he's very young 
So what are all these other people doing? That's one impact. The other impact is you walk through the studio and you have all of the researchers, and there's a screen which shows what is trending. So what people are reading now, what they are looking at on YouTube and elsewhere, and what is on top of the screen is what the directors and the management of the TV stations are saying, we need more of that. We need more of that. So not only are the algorithms pushing some of the news towards the top, but the management of the studio is saying, well, whoever recorded this is going to get a bigger bonus. So we are reinforcing the algorithms, us. So who's working for whom here? Are we working for the algorithms or the algorithms are working for us? And the next thing is, it's a TV station and they're showing the news. So what kind of news are they showing? They are showing the kind of news that appeals to their viewers because their viewers are allowing for the advertising income that the TV station needs for its survival. And they are fighting for their survival. And who is watching TV and their news? It's men who are 50 plus. So the kind of news and the, the way they show the news is to appeal to this audience. These people drive cars, and so they criticize the fact that the mayor of the city is trying to close the streets for traffic and, uh, and putting them for the free use of pedestrians. So those, those decisions that the voters in Montreal in a democratic process have voted for are being criticized by the TV station. So wh where is the role of diplomacy? of democracy, the role of the media in promoting democratic processes and decision making. Thank you. And this is, this is largely addressed to the, to the young people who technology you can do with your, in your sleep, including the young gentleman, I think he's still at the end of the table. Um, technology is not, technology is, I think you mentioned we have to defend ourselves against it. I used to be in the field of democracy, but now I'm in, I work for a technology entrepreneur. And he, he doesn't let us talk about problems without talking about solutions. In fact, we wouldn't lose our jobs if we only focused on problems. And, and he, I just want to mention to the young people, one solution to democracy that's being provided through technology that some of you may or may not know about. Because I'm based in South Africa, and and on the continent, we've probably had some of the worst elections, arguably, uh, up until recently in the world, and also some of the least <laughs> accountable leaders. And one of the results is that we've had a lot of people who've become very innovative in trying to counter it now that there's technology that can help them without putting them so much as at risk as previously. And in 2008, some people might remember Kenya had a very terrible election which resulted in violence quite a great deal. There was a technology entrepreneur called Juliana Rotich from Nairobi who invented uh, an app called Ushahidi. Mm -hmm. And Ushahidi means witness. And basically, it, it does new things now, but what it enabled them to do during the Kenyan elections when they blew up into, into disaster <coughs> was it, it used its mobile technology. At that point, they didn't even need to use smartphones. And it enabled them to track via SMS where violence was taking place. So they could, the, where the pockets of violence were, they could send troubleshooters and try to tamp it down. They sent mediators, they sent the church, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it initially was created for crisis response. It was technology for crisis response, and it didn't need to be a smartphone. And it helped, that election still resulted in a lot of people dying, but quite a lot fewer they think, because of this technology, which at the time was quite new. Then they decided, and it's open source, so people can adapt it to their different needs. Um, in South Africa, in one case, in Pretoria, it was adapted to try to enforce accountability of local councillors. And the local councillors, the people sent them to the, region, to the town of Pretoria, to the places where the water was not being delivered, and they said, send us where they we're having problems. They text messaged that information in. Election observers now are also using it. It's very affordable, and it's just, it's one example where the crisis of democracy can actually be solved, or at least addressed. It's a good example. And accountability being built up by, so, can I ask you by the people. Yeah. Um, I think that the conclusion is technology 
can be crafted by innovative people like all of you to become part of the solution to keep leaders accountable? The first one concerns how to explain those dynamics which are going on. And I think uh, we have a new wave of technological uh, innovation. You mentioned it uh, partly. Uh, and we have it always had in the past. But today we are going into a very strong restructuring of the total society by IT applications. And I think this is due to the complex uh, of industry and uh, science and technology uh, which is intimately interconnected like the military industrial complex which we discussed uh, a few decades ago. There is a special dynamic for atomic energy which happened and we see in this example that it might be reversible because atomic energy is not anymore the solution for all energy problems, as an example. So I think uh, what uh, concerns the solution, we may have the opportunity, if this complex of the new industry, Google and things like this, they are very strongly underpinned by political uh, governance, actually. And uh, if we uh, disconnect this industrial complex, the new one, and the political governance, we might be able to regulate uh, the uh, uh, application of this technology, and we might be able to uh, govern by many interventions of the society in different parts from yeah. below and above that we have we master because actually we are governed by this technological innovation by this combination of industry and politicians Thank you. it seems to me that, that technology is very complicated it can be used for good so there's, but there are certain things we do know it can be used for good or evil yeah. we also know that it ex always demands an expansion in the scale of governance, whether it was the move from hunter-gatherer bands to settled farming communities that required middle-aged small state governance. With the printing press, we had to have then national governance. And now all of this stuff means we have to have some kind of global governance. You know, actually, it's complicated, but you know what? It's actually terribly simple. If we keep talking about super or artificial intelligence, why don't we talk about super or artificial stupidity? <laughs> Cathy O'Neill, who was a mathematician, wrote a book called Weapons of Math. <laughs> math, not mass, math destruction, and it's worth reading. Constitutionalists say three things. One, technology is never deterministic. We make technology, technology does not make us. Two, the survival of our species will depend not on palliative technological fixes, but on curative, systemic, and mindset change. And three, algorithm-based digital and robotic technologies will doubtless prove valuable tools in creating a better world but only real world participative deliberation, and that's democracy, by the way, can define and confer legitimacy on the ends that will make that world better. So let's be clear about that. Just a few words. Uh, in the kaleidoscope of world politics, we have regimes that are somewhat democratic and somewhat authoritarian. Uh, but the two issues that, which affect most of these, and I just mentioned two words, voter apathy, which seems to have a problem in the democratic side, and I'm not sure that technology handles that, and fear. If you get into involving politics in an authoritarian state, it's dangerous, so you don't participate. So I think fear and apathy are two factors that have to be taken into our larger equation, that's all.
I think we won't uh, get nasty if I say that we've been already 15 years in fourth industrial revolution. Mm. And the climax of fourth industrial revolution is expected only in 2025. For and everything is going to change. Human being is going to change. So thank you.